Well, I'm glad you all made it. It's cold out tonight, but I'm glad you made it anyway. Um, we had a really nice warm period for a few days, and now I guess we're back to a cold snap. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a reading a verse from Revelation, and then we're going to get into our study, and I'll explain how that connects to everything. So if we could turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. And I'm going to be reading uh, Revelation 2, 18 through 23. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze, I know your works, your love and faith and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Today we're going to be looking a little bit at a movement known as progressive Christianity these days. Progressive Christianity is basically the son of liberal Christianity that we looked at maybe about a year ago. Pastor did a series on cults and liberal Christianity. Now, the progressives are basically the offshoot of that, except that they've taken up a lot more of the radical ideas of the modern world and society. And that's unfortunate because the Christianity they're teaching has some fundamental flaws that may not only cause harm to them, but cause harm to other Christians if they paint us with a broad brush and say we're all part of that. The good thing is we're going to look at it for two reasons. Basically, we're going to look at it so that we can strengthen our own understanding of what God's teaching us, and we're going to look at them in a positive way as a mission field because we want to try to help God accomplish his goal of saving everyone. He doesn't want to lose any of his children, but as we look at some of the verses in here, we'll find he gave us free will. So it's our choice whether we're saved or not. So they represent a mission field that we can go out and try to explain to them the error of their way and hopefully bring them home so that we'll see them all in heaven when that day comes. Um, today it's very difficult to make godly choices um, it's basically you either have to follow God or you follow man's ways those difficult choices would be much better and would lead us down a path of success if instead of choosing the way that the progressives have done, the way of the world, if we make sure we're always choosing God's way. The progressives have gone with the easy choices, and that's what makes them a problem, because following God is not easy. He never said our lives would be easy to follow him, but he sets a standard in the Bible, a true standard of right from wrong that we have to follow. The progressives ask questions like, is there really a heaven? Is there really a hell? Is everyone saved? Because a, a loving God wouldn't send anyone to hell, even if they walk away and never choose to accept him. Um, does he condemn people of homosexual beliefs, of other beliefs that are considered fairly antisocial? They don't believe the Bible is inspired by God. It's works written by man, so that allows them to choose, pick and choose verses that they want to follow. It loses 
the fact that it is true, right, and wrong. It's a standard that we can follow from. And they're trying to create a community of people that don't care about God's will for any of this. A uh, community of some Christians, some who think they're Christians. A community of skeptics who don't believe in anything. A uh, community of atheists and agnostics. A uh, community of all sexual orientations and gender identities. Uh, they're trying to make this community of one world that is not biblical in any way, shape, or form. And as I said, to strengthen our own beliefs, we need to look at the false teachings that they're doing. And one of the big reasons is because progressives be will look at the world and say, why are you excluding people? I mean, this person doesn't believe in Christ, but what stops him from going to heaven? I mean, that's the foundation of Christianity. But they look at historical Christians or biblical Christians and say, you're the problem in the world because you exclude these people. And we don't exclude them. We just try to teach them God's Word. But they look at that as being exclusive. One of the most serious misteachings we're going to look at, at today is their belief in, in hell. A lot of the progressive Christianities don't believe there is a literal hell. That there's no consequence for anything we do. And if there's no consequence for anything we do in life, then why would we try to be good in any way, shape, or form? They're of the belief that if it doesn't hurt someone else, yeah, do whatever you feel like. And none of this is found in biblical Christianity. And they're not compatible with the teaching of Christ during the time he was teaching his ministry on earth. He never said that, I don't care whether you believe in me or not, just everyone goes to heaven. So let's start by looking at um, what the Bible says on heaven. Let's turn to Luke 16, verses 19 through 26. It's a good section that will show us that there is a literal hell. Luke 16, verse 19 starts with, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores. And this is not the Lazarus from the other story with Jesus. This is just another name. Uh, and at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, Remember that in your lifetime, that in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. We'll continue this at the end, and you'll see a connection to what is happening. Um, but this is a good example from the Bible. In many places, Jesus taught 
there is a literal hell. He was one of the first hellfire and brimstone ministers. He spoke quite often of it. And the progressives just ignore that part of the Bible. As I said, they don't believe that the Bible is inspired, so they can pick and choose what they want to accept. Interestingly, they're being successful. In 2014, a Pew Research Center poll found that 29% of Catholics, 11% of evangelicals, or Bible, really Bible-believing Christians, and 40% of Protestants, did not believe in the literal existence of hell. If we delete hell from the Christian doctrine, we cheapen the cross. We cheapen Christ's sacrifice and his death on the cross. It doesn't mean anything anymore if there's nothing that he saved us from. So what are they teaching what are the progressives teaching instead of hell? If hell is so clear in the Bible, what are they teaching? There's three main things that they're teaching about hell. They're teaching something known as annihilationism. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. They're teaching something known as universalism, and they're teaching something known as inclusivity, inclusivism. And I'm going to talk briefly about each of them so we know what their teaching is. And then I'm going to talk about what the Bible says in response to each of those. The false teaching that they teach on annihilationism is a teaching that when people die, if they are not saved, they just cease to exist. Their basis for this is not the Bible in any way, but their personal belief that a loving God would not send someone to hell to be punished for eternity. They don't accept that. So they choose to ignore everything in the Bible and teach on their personal belief. And this is what they've developed to try to calm themselves down. That instead of going to hell, people just cease to exist when they die. That also lets them teach that hell is a mythical place. It doesn't truly exist. Because there's no need for it if people cease to exist. They use one verse in Matthew for their basis for this. It's in Matthew chapter 10, and I'll, I'll briefly read it. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. They take that word destroy and what they're doing is they're misapplying it. The word destroy is used 80 times. The, the underlying Greek word is used 80 times in the Bible. So we have a good understanding of what it really means. Uh, a couple of the ways they use it would be in... Um, the fishermen or the apostles when they were on a fishing boat and the storm came up and they were afraid they were going to drown. That's Matthew chapter 8, verse 25. In that, his disciples, it says, and his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. That's actually the same word as destroy in that other verse. Here the word is showing that the apostles are afraid of drowning. It has nothing to do with destruction of their soul. Um, a couple of other places it's used in Matthew chapter 2. An angel tells Joseph to take Jesus to Egypt to flee Herod because he wants to destroy him. Here it's talking about just the killing of a child. In Luke 21... The word is used to refer to the hair on our head dying. In Mark 14, it refers to the wasting. Um, it, it refers to the wasting of perfume. I misspelled it and had trouble reading it. It refers to the wasting of perfume when it's applied to the Lord's feet and his body. Um, 
you can't destroy the soul of perfume. So obviously that word does not mean it in that context. In Acts 8, when Simon the magician is trying to buy the Holy Spirit from the apostles so he can do the same healings they're doing. They're told, he's told by the apostles that uh, we hope your money dies with you. That's where it uses that same word for destroy again. And money doesn't have a soul. At least, if you're a Christian, you don't think it is. It does. But we'll get to that in a couple of moments anyway. Um, and finally, the same word for destroy is used in Matthew 9. In Matthew 9, verse 17, it's, a, uh, it's the parable of putting old wine, a new wine into old wineskins. Verse 17 reads, Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Here, Christ is teaching that wineskins will burst. It has nothing to do with loss of their soul, basically they're them ceasing to exist. And that's what the progressives say this word means, because they have not done their homework to study the word. They don't look at the Bible as being inspired, so it can say anything they want it to say. So what do we see it means? It could mean the murdering of a child, the wasting of perfume, the breaking of wineskins, the drowning of a person in a storm, or even the death of your hair, a loss of your hair. So it could mean any of those. There is no biblical teaching that we cease to exist when we die. Yet, the progressives are teaching that. That's what they teach as part of their annihilation theory. The second theory they teach for death to avoid hell from existing is universalism. Progressives are being taught incorrectly incorrectly, that every single person who has ever lived will be saved and taken into heaven. The main argument they use for that is again a good and loving God wouldn't sentence someone to hell for eternity. You can see there's a pattern building here with the progressive teachings is they're not doing scholarship to say, what does the Bible say? What did the inspire words God had the apostles write and the other authors of the books write and put down for us to teach us what he wants us to know? They're using their own feelings. I think it says this. I'd like it to say that. They've been tainted by pressure to accept that everyone is entitled to their own belief, that it is wrong for a historically biblical Christian to try to teach the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. They consider them to be biased if you're doing that. They say people have a right to their own belief and it doesn't mean they're not going to go to heaven. And we know the only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ. Some of the progressives, even the ones that teach universalism, will concede that people may spend a small period of time in hell to burn off sins before they're accepted into heaven. It's a lot like the Roman Catholic belief in purgatory. The only difference is you don't put money in the coffer to try to buy your relatives out quicker. Christianity today actually called the teaching of universalism by the progressive movement as the opiate of the modern Christian. They want to feel good, so they're taking drugs. And their drug is, I can make the Bible say whatever I want it to. So what does the Bible really teach us about this? In Matthew 10, verse 28, We read this earlier, but it's the same context. It teaches us, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. 
Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And that was inspired writing. Matthew was inspired by God to teach us that. He didn't just take a pen out and decide, I think I want to write this. Also, in Matthew 23, verse 33, Jesus is addressing a group of scribes and Pharisees. Here he tells them, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? If hell was not a literal place that we get sent to if we don't find salvation in Christ Jesus, why would they have been inspired to write that? We also see this in John 3, 36. More proof that there is a literal hell. John chapter 3, verse 36 reads, Who be Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. John the Baptist was teaching that to his followers when he recognized the Messiah. Inclusivism is the final thing the progressives teach in this area. It's one step past universalism, but it's got the same foundations and so the arguments against it are, are very similar. The difference is they teach that everyone is saved through Jesus Christ whether or not they know it. So Christ's death on the cross saved everyone in the world, even those who never heard of him or rejected him. They still get his salvation. So Christians obviously are saved, Muslims, Buddhists, pagans, Hindus, Taoists, atheists, and even agnostics who are unsure of whether there is a God are all saved by the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross. Well, if they accept him, they would be. But to say that they will not go to hell whether or not they accept him is just a completely false teaching, and there's no biblical foundation for it. God does want everyone to be saved. But because he gave us free will, there is a condition. If we look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, we see that God wants to save everyone. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 starts with, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that's the key there. They need to come to the knowledge of the truth, the truth that Jesus Christ is the salvation. We need to come to him to be reconciled with God the Father. And it's that free will that means we have to act, take that step and accept him. The Apostle Paul was very clear in his teachings as well, that you must believe in Christ in order to be saved. In Romans chapter 10, verse 13 and 14, it says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? That's a big section where the progressives go wrong. They can't say that you're saved through the act of Jesus Christ's sacrifice whether or not you've even heard of him, whether or not you've even accepted him. Because the Bible doesn't teach that. Based on this, though, that reading where how will they call on him whom they have not believed? 
we need to think about that as we go through our daily lives. We need to ask ourselves, we've all been called to spread the good news, not just the pastors, not just the teachers. Each and every one of us has been called. Christ left that command for us before he returned to heaven. In Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, is the Great Commission. And that reads, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of time. So when we leave here today, tomorrow, next week, we need to be asking ourselves, are we talking about the good news, the gospel with people, so that they too can be saved? Because that's the only way that they'll be able to do it. Someone has to introduce them to it for the Holy Spirit to take over. Okay, you've planted it, now I'll make it grow. Finally, if we look back at Luke and our story of Abraham, Lazarus, and the rich man, if we go back to verse 27, we're going to see that he says, verse 27 continues, and he said, Then I beg you, Father, talking to Father Abraham, to send him, uh, talking about uh, Lazarus, the poor man, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. What's God trying to teach us in this section of Scripture? It's clear that where he talks about Moses and the prophets, he's talking about the Bible, Scripture. At this time, it would have been more Old Testament, but now the New Testament is there. And that the only way people will believe is through hearing the good news, through hearing the gospel, through hearing the scriptures. We can't go to them, whether we were dead or resurrected or what, and save their souls, no matter what we say to them. If we introduce them to the scriptures, the Holy Spirit can then take over and do its work, the miracle of saving their soul. And that's basically what the progressives are teaching about hell and the real biblical truth as to the answers for it. Are there any questions? Then let's bow our heads and close in a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name. Thank you for this chance to worship you through song, through reading of your word, and through just gathering as a church. Not just a church within a wall, but a church, the universal church of all those who are Christians. Please help us to see opportunities where we can spread the word to people. Please help us to go out boldly to spread the word. A lot of us, including me, are very timid when it comes to that. So please give us the strength to go boldly forth and spread your word. And we ask this all in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen.